Hey, everybody. How's it going tonight? Good to see everybody tonight. So if we could have, uh, uh, you know, all of our electeds up here to join me. I think I see Mayor St Spano. Give him a hand, everybody. I think I saw Commissioner Green. There she is. Let's hear from her. And Representatives Yoakum and Flanagan are making it here. And let me tell you, I totally identify with them. Earlier this week, I was late from my own, own forum because I was battling the traffic. So, you know, uh, they'll be here with us in short order. But because you got here, uh, we're not going to wait. We're gonna, just going to get started. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So uh, I'm just uh, ask everybody to get situated up here and get comfortable uh, and just say that um, a lot of times when we, when we reach out to our government, it's not exactly clear you know, um, who we should call out to who's going to help. We have various levels of government. But all of us work on everything. We just work on different pieces of it. So, for example, you might say, well, okay, Keith, you're in Congress, so that means you deal with issues of war and peace. Well, Peggy Flanagan, who's a state legislator, uh, they have the Minnesota National Guard has been deployed. Uh, and the county, uh, with Marion Green, works on veterans affairs issues, and cities have yellow ribbon programs. Um, you might say, well, okay, so immigration's a federal issue, right? Yes, but... Commissioner Green and I are working on detention policy right now. And uh, Representative Flanagan works on these issues all the time around immigration. And of course, uh, whenever you have a new influx of, of, of uh, residents, uh, they uh, are uh, some, the mayor works to make sure that uh, they are integrated into our community. My point is we all do everything. We just work on different pieces of it. We're all working on housing. We're all working on homelessness. We're all working on schools but we just have different pieces of it that we work on. And I think now we got a full compliment because Representatives Flanagan and Yoakum have made it here. And let's hear it from them. And Cheryl and Peggy, I just told everybody earlier this week, I was late for my own forum, so don't worry about it. We're all here. We're all here. We're fighting that traffic. It's, you know, it's not winter, so it must be you know, construction season. So in other words, uh, we uh, work together. We work together as a team on issues of transportation. Some of you all know about the Southwest Light Rail. Well, uh, so uh, half the money is federal, and yet it's completely inappropriate for me to come up with a siting decision. That is uh, something local electeds are going to, with citizen input, are going to decide. And of course, the state had an obligation on that. And, Everybody's doing the best they can to, to move transportation and cut congestion and all that. So tonight, um, what we're going to do is, is we're all going to talk to you a little bit about what we do. Uh, we're, we've been calling this Civics 101. I want you to know that my office has done how many of these things, uh, Matt? Five. And uh, all of them have been really fun. And uh, as you know, the 5th Congressional District uh, is 15 suburban communities in Minneapolis, including St. Louis Park, Hopkins, Golden Valley, 25% of Edina, all of Richfield, uh, uh, Robbinsdale, Crystal, New Hope, um, Brooklyn Center, Fridley, Columbia Heights, Spring Lake Park, St. Anthony. So it's a lot of real estate, but physically is the smallest congressional district in the state because we're so populous here. Let me just say what I do, and then I'm going to pass the microphone to our state leaders. Congress is a government of limited power based on the Constitution. Under the Constitution, we have specified things that we do in Congress, and everything else is left up to the state. So for example, the, only the United States Senate uh, works on confirmation of Supreme Court justices. That doesn't even come to the House, and it doesn't come to the other electeds here tonight. And yet, all federal taxation must originate in the House of Representatives. We, I, I work on things like interstate commerce. We worked on the things that affect the, the whole country, like national transportation policy, 
national health care policy. On education, about 10 percent of any given school district's budget is going to come from the federal government. Most of it's going to come from state and local sources. In Congress, uh, you all know that over the past several years, we've worked on everything from the Affordable Care Act to banking reform. I saw somebody here earlier. I, do, I am in favor of an updated and modern Glass-Steagall, and I'm on that piece of legislation. I believe that's important. I'm on the Financial Services Committee, and we ha I helped pass the legislation that gave you the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which has turned, returned about $11.5 billion back to consumers. We also work on, uh, a, a, a whole, uh, uh, I mentioned federal taxation, worked on immigration. Right now, uh, when, when we go back into Congress, we're going to be facing a few things that I wanted to let, tell you about. One of them is there's been an effort to repeal the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And while I'll be among the first to admit there's ways to improve it, there's no way that I'm going to vote to repeal it because it extended health care to too many people and brought insurance reform. Uh, now, it does need to be fixed in the individual market, and I'm all for that. We need a willing partner who wants to do that. Uh, and now we've seen uh, some members of the Republican and Democratic caucuses begin to say, okay, now that you've tried to repeal it 70 times, can we now start talking about <laughs> fixing the real problems? And, that, and, and so I don't know if that's going to happen, but there are folks trying, and I'm willing to support any effort like that. Um, I also believe in comprehensive uh, immigration reform. I'm a very strong believer uh, that we've got to increase wages in our country. We are at historic income inequality. And the federal minimum wage is important because even though states like Minnesota have already set their own minimum wage, there are some states in the country that have no minimum wage. Louisiana has no minimum wage. So if it were not for the federal minimum wage, they could pay people less than $7.25 an hour. I do disagree with people who say that increasing the minimum wage hurts business. In fact, if that were true, Minnesota's economy would be doing worse than Wisconsin's. It's not. I am very disturbed that in the state of Missouri, the state just lowered the minimum wage. In, 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 St. Louis, in St. Louis, the other one, <laughs> in Kansas City, they increased minimum wage. The state legislature and governor have reduced it. And I'm telling you, the, one of the biggest problems with slow growth in our economy, in my opinion, is that you cannot sell what other people cannot afford because they're making so little money. We have a demand-based problem in our economy. We have, and, and, I, and I tell you, you know, the economy did, did, is, does better where people make more money. They spend more money. And if you are a rich person, let's imagine yourself a billionaire. Any billionaires in the house? If you drove a Lamborghini every single day of the week, you would not sell enough of them in order to keep the company afloat. If General Motors sells 30, uh, um, I don't know, of their top of the line car, they're going to go out of business. And if, you're a billion, and if you're a rich person, why would you need more than 30 cars? That's kind of a lot. But you, 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 that's about all you'd need. But You've got to literally sell thousands of them. We, the, if the American working and middle classes don't have any money, the economy slows down and, and, and is in real trouble. Let me say that when I come back, I want to talk, make two more points and then I'll hand it over. When we come back, we're going to continue to protect the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You should know that I think that we do need uh, um, Medicare for all. I believe in that. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I want to be open with you. Those of you who don't agree, I'm happy to discuss why I believe what I believe, and you can talk about what you believe. Um, so we're going to continue to protect health care access. We also, Republican caucus, and again, it's a majority rule system, so whoever has the speaker gets to decide the agenda. There's only one person who can say what we shall be voting on, and that is the Speaker of the House. If the Speaker doesn't say we can vote on it, we're not voting on it. There is an exception for something called a discharge petition. But it's very rare. The speaker says he's going to bring up corporate tax reform. Um, if that comes up, uh, I want you to know that I'm going to, I believe that uh, when you cut taxes, evidence shows that you create greater deficits. 
There are some people who believe that if you cut taxes, the corporations and the wealthy will take the money that they have, don't have to spend anymore and invest it into plant and equipment. This has never been documented. It's called trickle-down economics. I've never, ever seen it happen. If it can be demonstrated, hey, anything to improve the economy, right? But as a matter of fact, we just have never seen this. So my thing with corporate tax reform is going to be, uh, I'm going to engage that debate, but I'm not going to, uh, what, what they say smaller government, lower taxes, what it has amounted to is starve government, cut services. And over the course of the last several weeks, uh, based on the Trump budget, which is not law, and actually, to tell you the truth, no Democrats going to vote for it, and many Republicans will not vote for it, but he proposed it anyway. But we have had reforms on save the EPA, save the arts, save all this stuff, right? So, because we do not control the House, the Senate, or the White House, and the, so the, all we got is you, right? The people who say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to cut uh, water quality standards. We're not going to cut uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We're not going to cut the Appalachia Regional Council. We're not going to cut, uh, you know, SNAP, which is food stamps. We're not going to cut these things. And I'm telling you, we have a bipartisan group that is saying no to this, yet uh, it is going to be an ongoing debate, and we got to hear from you. If there's a pro federal program that you think has, is worthy and good, we want to hear from it. If you think there's a program that's no good, and maybe we can cut it, I'm not open to that. Look, I'm not in love with the federal program, but I do like the idea of protecting programs that are good and bring value into people's lives. And so when Mick Mulvaney, who is the head of the um, Office of Management and Budget, says that the Meals on Wheels program is not valuable, I say to him, there are many, many disabled and seniors who rely on Meals on Wheels in order to stay in their own homes. And if you cut that program, all you can do is force them into a nursing home, which is going to be more expensive. So if you know a program is good, let me know. If you think, yeah, this program is not very good, I'm not married to any of these things. But if it's a good program, I'm here to save it. Also, National Endowment of the Arts, good program. Doesn't just help big cities. If it weren't for National Endowment of the Arts, there would be a whole lot of rural areas where there's no arts funding at all. So that's something that's coming up. So we'll be having that conversation about tax reform. And then uh, we expect to have a conversation about, um, about uh, uh, other, other things coming up, whether it's net neutrality and you all, and you're during your part, can ask about any of these things. I got staff here because um, I don't know everything. And, uh, they might help me in, if you ask questions that I don't have a good answer to. Uh, I'll be up front and tell you I don't know that, and then we'll see if we can get you an answer. But there are a few things I do know, so we'll do the best we can. Well, Steve, thanks for coming. You know, several congressmen refuse to meet with their citizens this time. They're afraid of us. Well, it's good to see you, my dear. <laughs> well, it's good to see you. So at least once a year we get together and have lunch, right? <laughs> this is what we will be doing, right? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, one of the great things about being in Congress is you got these staff who do this wonderful work, and you get to take credit for it. <laughs> now, thank you. Thank you. You know what? My wisest choices have been the people that I've hired. Let me introduce. Y'all want to meet my staff before I... <laughs> so, uh, you got Jamie Long. Stand up there. See the tall fella? <laughs> Laura Helgen is an uh, intern. Stand up, Lauren. You got Sarah Sanchez way in the back. Say hi, Sarah. Uh, you got Matt Croson right there. So you got Sadaf Rahmani right there. And there, do, who else is here? Did I get, oh, yeah, we got Carl right there. And there is a staffer who's not physically present but is here. Her name is Abigail Shanfield, and her mom is here. So you got to stand up for Abby today. Yeah. Not, not every one of my staff members is from Minnesota, but just about all of them are. 
only a few exceptions. So with that, I want to introduce to you a um, tremendous uh, friend of mine for many years, Cheryl Yoakum, is a state representative. I met her before she got to the city council, then she went to the city council, then she went to the state legislature. She's fighting for you every single day. Put your hands together for Cheryl Yoakum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, I, I don't drive a Lamborghini, so I was late because I take transit every day. And my, my bus, even though I left early on the early bus, got me home 20 minutes late to pick up my car to get here. So um, so I apologize. I usually try not to be late. But it's, our transportation system is wonderful but needs some work. And that kind of rolls into the first thing I was going to talk about, which is how well our, our federal, state, and local governments and county governments work together on certain projects like Southwest Light Rail. Um, I started on the Hopkins City Council. I served there for nine years. The last two and a half years about, I was on the quarter management committee for Southwest Light Rail. And before that, I was doing advocacy work for it. And as a state rep, I've kind of picked that up as well with all these fine folks at the table who've been fighting every day to try to get funding for it. And now we've kind of, we're turning it over to the feds and crossing our fingers and asking for their help. And Congressman Allison has been a phenomenal champion for it. And one of those programs that he's talking about that's Trump's considering cutting is the fast track program that funds some of these projects. So if you care about expanding our transit system in our state and our roads and our bridges, make sure that you're contacting Congressman Allison about the fast track program as well. So that's a really good example on how the different levels of government work really, really well together, specific projects. Um, what we do at the state level, for those of you who may, may not know, because it can be kind of mysterious. I remember going up as an advocate about 14 years ago to watch my first floor house session. I was starting to do advocacy work for early childhood and family education. And I watched bills being introduced on the house floor. And the speaker, um, the, uh, the person in front of the speaker, our chief clerk, would read off the bill number and say, introduce, like a, almost like an auctioneer, and just hit the gavel, and then nothing else, and then they'd move on to the next item. And I was like, what's going on? So I remember talking to, at the time, Representative Steve Simon afterwards and saying, OK, explain this to me like I'm five. <laughs> I don't quite understand what just happened. So you always have legislators and folks around you that you can always ask questions of. But at the state level, in basic terms, we have we set budget and we set policy for the state. And we do this in a two-year cycle. We have a biennium. So the first year of the biennium, we set the budget. That's what we just did this last session. And the next year of the biennium is traditionally a policy and a bonding year. Um, this last year, we also did a bonding bill because the year before we didn't do one. So sometimes things get a little mixed up if people are a little cantankerous up there, which has frequently been, been frequent lately. So we have that two-year cycle. And during the budget process, most of the budget committees are very focused. We have budget and policy committees. But you can still hear bills that are policy. A lot of policy bills also have budget in them. So you have a policy process. And that, that gavel-banging auctioneering I heard in the beginning was the, the House Speaker's um, office sending those, budget, sending those bills to specific committees to be heard. And once it's in a committee, it's heard, and it can move on to the next committee of its jurisdiction. And then it has to go to the House floor if it passes those. House floor votes on it, sends it off. Same thing's happening in the Senate. Then both those bills come off the floor. They may not look alike, so they go to conference committee. Conference committee between the Senate and the House hash out the differences. They go back to the Senate and the House, pass, and then hit the governor's desk. Sometimes that can take a bill if someone really, really loves it and has a gavel and has some power as short as a week. Most of the time, it can take two or three years, or anything in between. So that's, that's the task. One of the number one tasks of your state legislature is to set policy and to set budget. Um, another thing that I like, one of the best things I like about the job is that we're there to be ombudsman, now say that fast three times, to our constituents to make sure that they're being treated fairly by state agencies. We'll get phone calls about someone saying, hey, I've been waiting two months for my title to get transferred on my car. What can you do? And we have a wonderful group of constituent services folks that help us out with that. So never be afraid to reach out to your state rep about questions like that. That's what we're here for. We're here to make sure that government's working for you because you pay for the government. So we need to make sure that it's working. And that's one of the biggest parts of our jobs, too, is making sure that it's working and that we're ombudsmen for you. 
And another thing is to also be your voice up at the Capitol. That's why it's so, so, so very important for us to hear from you. And I know Peggy's going to cover this a little bit more, but it helps us even if you're like, oh man, Cheryl and Peggy know how I feel. Ron Latz knows how I feel. I don't need to tell them. They, we agree. No, 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 no. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from you so that we can take your stories and talk to our colleagues and let them know, this is what I'm hearing from my constituents. This is why it's important to them. Let me tell you a story because that really can make a difference in getting our colleagues to understand and hear from the other side. And then the last thing, too, is to make sure that we're keeping you informed about what's going on. Now, there's a, we have a Minnesota House website and a Minnesota Senate website that are nationally renowned for having amazing information. You can go on and create a whole list of bills that you care about, and it will It'll email you when they're going through committees. There's things that you can look up. There's stat, stat, statistics, facts. Wonderful way to keep connected. Most of the legislators, we all do weekly updates or monthly during interim. Um, we hold town halls. We hold coffees. We're out in the community. Personally, I do a coffee once, right before session starts every two weeks, all the way through, sesh, all the way through April. I'll be starting those a little early this year. So one of our big jobs also is to make sure we're keeping you informed about what's going on. Um, and then you can always hit delete if it's too much information. But a lot, of us, a lot of us put out weekly updates and like to keep folks informed. So I want to keep under seven minutes. So I think that's about it. But I just want you to know that we're working for you. I have 40,000 bosses. So always remember that. The capital is yours. That's the people's house. We work for you. Never, ever be afraid to contact us. And you know another little secret, what I used to tell people when I did advocacy work, if you're shy and want to leave a message and don't really want to talk to anybody, do it after hours. We pick those up and record them. So that's a good place to start. But we're just like, <laughs> we're just like you guys. We take transit. We have other jobs. We have families. We don't drive Lamborghinis. So, but d don't be afraid to reach out to us. And if you haven't um, signed up for our weekly updates, I know Peggy and I both have them. Make sure you go onto the House website and do that. So. I would like to introduce my next, next person in line, one of my favorite people, and I, I am going to steal your phrase. She always says, we're partners in justice, not in crime. State Representative Peggy Flanagan. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Peggy Flanagan. I'm the state rep for the 46A side, so essentially everything that is north of Minnetonka Boulevard. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I used to come here as a kid when we had to sew our little patches on to our bathing suits. Anybody remember this, right, at the rec center? So it's fun to be here as a grown-up. Um, but I'm here to talk to you uh, about some advocacy and sort of state-level advocacy. And the way my path to the legislature was a winding one. Um, and the way that I got to the state legislature was really um, by being an advocate. And I grew up right here in St. Louis Park. My mom moved us to this community. Um, we had a Section 8 housing voucher. And she wanted to make sure that I grew up in a community that was stable and where I would have opportunity for a really great education. And that's also why I'm raising my daughter here too. We, yeah, you can clap for that. Um, we also used SNAP at the time, it was called Food Snaps, the, the Food Stamps. The Child Care Assistance Program helped my mom to go back to school and get a better paying job. And these programs really helped to lift my family out of poverty. And I'm unafraid to talk about those things. Because when we talk about Medicaid, which also was a program that saved my life, we're talking about real people. And one of the, the reasons that um, I feel really grateful to be represented uh, by Congressman Ellison is because he gets that. He gets that we're talking about real people. And so as I started to tell my story, um, and eventually found myself working for Children's Defense Fund, um, found that there were a lot of folks who didn't necessarily feel represented or heard over at the Capitol. And when it came to having advocates for children and families, I can tell you this, there are a lot of lobbyists 
who lobby on a lot of stuff. There aren't a whole lot of lobbyists who lobby on behalf of children and families. And so for me, that was the path. When we worked to raise the minimum wage um, a few years ago, as Congressman Ellison talked about, but it's not enough. It should be higher. Um, when we work to try to pass paid family leave and again invest in the child care assistance program, these are the programs that I really cared about and making sure that real people felt represented. So I decided when the opportunity arose to get engaged and get involved and to run for the seat. But here's what's most surprising to me, sort of once I got on the inside and I sort of feel like a community advocate who's now sitting at those tables. Right, sitting at committee hearings. So I'm like, wow, there's so many bills, and I think Marion also remembers this, there's so many bills that are introduced where Cheryl or I will raise our hand and be like, um, so who did you talk to about this before you introduced this bill? Right, or being um, a member of the, the White Earth Nation of the Native American community, there are many bills that directly affect Native folks and tribes, where Native people have not been talked to at all, or the communities who are directly affected haven't been talked to at all about these bills. And so when I think about what it means to be a good advocate, it means making sure on the inside and on the outside that the people who are directly affected are part of those conversations. So I think about when Cheryl and I have visited um, families at Perspectives, right? And we were able to pass a bonding bill to support Perspectives, which is an incredible program here. Um, and uh, it's affordable housing and uh, for women and their families and recovery, um, that that's what this is, this is all about. And so inviting us to places right like this, um, inviting us into your community, inviting us into your organization, coming by for coffee, that all matters and those stories matter. Because when we're sitting in committee hearings and bills are introduced and they're disconnected from real people, we're actually not doing our job, or at least not doing our job very well. So that's really critical. And I think that that's something you know, that we try to do in our work. The last thing that I'll say as we talk about what statewide advocacy can look like, part of our job is also working with folks who live all across the state. Of course, we represent our core community. But in order to get things done, we have to figure out how to build relationships with other people. So one of the things um, you know, that, that we work on right now is looking at water quality. Right? So we've been having conversations about wild rice, protecting wild rice. Um, here in Minnesota, we have a lot of lakes, right? That's the word on the street. Um, uh, a lot of folks like to go up north, right? Enjoy these resort communities. And water's really important to us. And so one of the things that we've been able to do as we're looking at um, issues of water quality, of, of pipelines, is to have conversations with land order owners in northern Minnesota, to make sure that we're having conversations with tribes, we're having conversations with young people who care tremendously about climate change, and figuring out how to work together to advocate um, on behalf of the issues that we really care about. So that we're not just saying, this is what the representative from St. Louis Park thinks, right? But this is what our shared values and our collective position. So that's part of what we're doing too. And the last thing that I'll say as I'm finishing up here is for the first time ever, we've created something called the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus in the House DFL. Yay, thanks. And that is, we went from four members to nine members um, in the last election. <laughs> Woo! Um, and uh, essentially what that has meant is that we have been able to introduce an agenda um, where we're working in partnership. Um, so I'll work to support issues that Representative Ilhan Omar has introduced. And she'll support Representative Jamie Becker-Finn. And again, we're sort of looking at 
moving agendas that are good for people of color and indigenous folks, but overall for the state of Minnesota too. And those voices have often been missing. There's 201 legislators, there's 14 people of color and indigenous folks in the legislature. Um, so we're trying to be more intentional about that work. And also that means many of us who are in that caucus are organizers ourselves and sort of come from that state advocacy or community advocate position. Um, so we're trying to move things on the inside and the outside. Um, and that's why it matters so much that all of you are here tonight. So th I really look forward to your questions. Uh, thanks so much for coming to St. Louis Park. Oh, and I'm gonna introduce you. Um, and so Commissioner Marion Green is my commissioner, um, and she uh, served in the State House, and then, so she's house trained, and now, uh, wah, wah, um, and now uh, she serves as Hennepin County Commissioner, and we are so lucky to have someone there who is a fierce advocate and understands state issues, serving us also at Hennepin County. So, Marion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's so nice to see you all here. And I want to do a particular call out, as somebody alluded to earlier, not all of our United States members of Congress are willing to meet with people from their district. And we, you know, we appreciate that about Keith. But there's something else going on here, which is this really great relationship amongst all of our jurisdictions. I was thinking about it, just the degree of collaboration and partnership that exists at this table is huge. And that's also not happening everywhere. Uh, and I just want to kind of acknowledge that. I remember that when I was at the House, like feeling really appreciative that the electeds all up and down the ticket in our communities are really working together. And it makes such a difference for our issues. So thank you, Keith, for being a part of the kind of tone setting for that. Um, I also want to thank you for bringing us together because nobody knows what county government does. <laughs> So I'm really excited to talk to all of you and tell you what I'm doing on your behalf and how I'm spending some of your money, and I think you'll be pleased. I do. I think you'll be pleased. Um, so Hennepin County has a budget of $2 billion, uh, and that's about a third federal dollars, a third state dollars, thank you both, <laughs> uh, and a third property tax dollars that we, we have um, tax taxing capability through property tax. And what... I would say kind of the most general description of what we do is we do what the state and federal government ask us to do. Uh, and so good examples of that might be that we're really the social safety net uh, in the re for regions across Minnesota. That's, that's work that the county does and I'm really proud of what Hennepin County does in that space. We're also the healthcare provider um, regionally. We also take on issues of regional importance, and in a way that's where the property tax comes on because we want to do things that we see need to get done for the region, where it doesn't make sense to do things citywide, but really to bump it up to the county. And in a way, that is a little moment of explanation about the history of county government. Um, for example, Hennepin County Library System, or the hospital system, or as we've just been discussing recently, transit. Uh, that is a space where it w hasn't been happening regionally. We were part of a collaboration that w wasn't successful, I would say, or I don't want to say it wasn't successful. It petered out <laughs> um, with other counties. And so the county is really taking on, for example, filling the gap on Southwest Light Rail uh, funding so that we can get that federal match. Uh, the board, there are seven Hennepin County commissioners, and we each come from a district, so one-seventh of Hennepin County. Uh, and the district that I'm really proud to serve you in is St. Louis Park, the, uh, all of St. Louis Park, and then the southwestern piece of Minneapolis, so west, Minneapolis west of 35W. And uh, also elected at the county level are the county attorney and the, the county sheriff. And we have kind of a, a complicated relationship, I would say, with those two offices because we set their budget, but they are elected in their own right. So they don't love it when we try to tell them what to do. And in some ways, we can't tell them what to do, which is a source of some frustration on the topic of immigration. But feel free to write me if you have a particular interest in that topic. <laughs> um, and then we also have the opportunity to champion things that are of particular interest to us or that we hear about from our constituents. Uh, and so just to give you kind of a sketch of what I'm working on, 
I'm working on immigration issues and how the county interacts with uh, people who are here, documented, undocumented. I, um, I personally wish there were no difference. Uh, and I guess I will put in a little plug on this issue, which is that I would argue that we don't want our property tax dollars being spent to do the job of the federal government. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so if, I, I think I'm inoculating you. If anybody tells you like, well, you know, you don't want to thumb your nose at the federal government, you're going to be breaking the law. No, 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 no. We just want to do our job. We want to stay in our lane. Uh, another issue that I have um, taken on and is of big emotional importance, I would say to me, is a project that we have called No Wrong Door, and that is our work to end the sex trafficking of youth. And as I've come to understand this issue, I am deeply uh, moved by its intersectionality with issues of race and sexism and sexual orientation. Uh, and so I'm really pleased that the county is leading this work in a, I would say, a nation leading way. I actually just met somebody from uh, Washington, D.C. who was telling me that no jurisdiction in the United States has staff dedicated to ending sex trafficking. And I was able to say, no, actually, that's not true. At Hennepin County, we do. And we have a hugely um, collaborative effort across human services so that we can respond effectively and support victims and help them to become survivors and leaders, uh, but then also on the demand side. So we've funded an investigator in the sheriff's office and a prosecutor in the county attorney's office. So we're working on that end, too, and I'm really happy about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, one of the other ways in which um, the county is serving you and the way that we provide health care is through an accountable care organization called Hennepin Health. And as our nation wrestles with how we pay for health care and we see a growing interest and a growing acceptance, I'm really glad to see, of health care as a right, we all deserve health care. <laughs> Everybody deserves health care. Uh, Hennepin Health is a model that is being looked at also across the nation and I, actually even internationally. People are very interested in what's going on with Hennepin Health. And I'm pleased that uh, Hennepin Health is what I would call an incubator, an incubator for new ways of delivering health care and seeing that health care isn't just about, you know, take an aspirin and sleep on it for two days, but it's also about things like housing and social services support. Those are health drivers as well. Uh, and then last but not least, and uh, Peggy, you gave such a good lead up to this, it's what's on your mind and getting to hear your stories and the things that are priorities for you. Just this morning, I met with a constituent who's extremely concerned that the um, that we have in our hands a way to reduce a incidence of HIV AIDS, and yet for some reason it's not getting out in the community the way it needs to in our region. And so, what can we do about that? You know, I'm so glad to hear that, and I'm really happy to be able to then touch base with our public health folks and say, okay, what is going on? What's the backstory here? How can we um, collaborate maybe with the um, foundations or with the manufacturer to make uh, a particular drug more accessible? But it's just one example, so please call on me. Uh, I feel as though we all learned in school to come to the Capitol, uh, either in St. Paul or in Washington, D.C., but come to your Hennepin County Government Center in downtown Minneapolis, <laughs> and um, I can cover the parking if you can't take the bus. <laughs> Yes, we have something called Citizens Academy uh, that's offered, I think, quarterly, uh, and it's a wonderful opportunity. You really get to kind of peek under the tent and see how the county does things. You get to visit the, um, I don't know, I think one of the really impressive things is all of the snow plows, honestly. Um, so yeah, Citizens Academy as well. So thank you. <laughs> And it's my pleasure to introduce the mayor of St. Louis Park, uh, who perhaps needs no introduction because he's such a man of the people, Jake Spano. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm Jake. Uh, I'm the mayor, and cities do everything that they don't do. Good night, everybody. <laughs> See, I, just, I just made your night a whole lot shorter. I just gave you all night back. Um, Thanks, everybody, for being here. I want to thank the congressman especially, um, and I will do my level best not to call him Keith. Uh, I, know, I know that I can. And I, I just want to, at the beginning, I, I want to start by saying 
uh, and I, I know pe people do this a lot, right? They say, oh, these are great people, they're great people. I will tell you that in all my time in politics, I have never picked up the phone and called one of these people that they have not taken my call on your behalf, right? And I just want to recognize how fortunate we are that the congressman, our state representatives, our state senator, Ron Latz, who couldn't be here tonight, and Marion are here uh, serving all of us. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, I'm going to sort of try and run through a few things uh, fairly quickly, a little bit just briefly about myself. I've been the mayor for a year and a half. I was on the council for four years before that. My wife teaches in the public schools here, and I've got two kids and a dog. Um, I serve on the uh, executive committee for the Regional Council of Mayors, and I was just named as the chair of the transit committee for the National League of Cities. So I'm very excited about, uh, and I'm going to DC next week to try and bust some chops on Southwest LRT. Um, so so that's, that's kind of, you know, some details about who I am, but why am I here? Why am I standing up here? is something that I always like to tell this story because I think it's an important one and I don't think I'm unique in, in this way. Um, 10, 12, 12 years ago, I was working in the private sector. I was very good at my job um, and Paul and Sheila died. And um, I won't say that their deaths were this cat sort of ca uh, catalyst for, for jumping up, but they, they made me start thinking, what am I doing? I mean. I work really, really hard. I miss holidays with my family and events with my friends. Is For what? Right? And there's nothing wrong with working in the private sector. I know many of you do. But not, it, was, it, it suddenly became a realization for me that this was not my calling. And so one day I walked into my boss's office at the urging, I shouldn't say urging, at the demand of my wife who cornered me in the kitchen and she said, you're miserable at your job. You need to change. And I went in and I quit. I got back into graduate school and I got an internship on a Senate campaign as a 36-year-old unpaid intern with a wife, two kids, and a brand new mortgage. And I told a group of Boy Scouts this the other night, your parents will understand this when I say this. Everybody in this room will understand this when I say this. There are times in your life when you work a job where Sunday night is the worst night of the week. Right? I see this nod yep, nodding heads. In the 12 years since I left the private sector and I've been doing public service, I've never had a bad Sunday night ever. And so I am, I am very honored to be able to be up here serving all of you and serving with all of these people. So thank you for the opportunity. It really means the world to me. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about city government uh, and kind of what, who we are, what we do. Uh, the city is comprised of eight separate departments. If you have your 2017 report to the community inside, you will see this little flyer. It's got sort of each one of the departments are detailed in there, so I'm not going to go into all of what they do. The council is made up of seven people, six council members and myself, and they are split by wards and what the council members are called ward and at large. So think a little bit about Congress. Congressman Ellison rep is one of eight representatives in the state of Minnesota. And we have two US senators. It's a little bit like that on the council. We have four ward members and two at large members and me. And no, that does not make me the president in that equation. Um, there's also, uh, just uh, speaking of the council, is contact information for all of us is right here. Okay, as well as on the back, you will see that we've included the school district's contact information. And I want to thank Jackie Larson. I don't know if ja Jackie might have had to leave. Our communications director put all of this stuff together. So grab, if you didn't grab one on the way in, grab one on the way out. Um, we set overall policy for the city, and that policy is carried out by the city manager and the city staff. Um, we are not what is sort of commonly referred to as a strong mayor system. Right? So people always ask me, like, well, what can you do? Well, I vote, just like everybody else, and I'm supposed to keep order at the meetings, and sometimes I'm successful. I haven't had to use the gavel yet, but sometimes, you know. Um, but strong mayor cities like Chicago or New York or, or, or places like that, I don't have those authorities. I sort of tell people that the council works more like, almost like a nonprofit, if you're familiar with that. The council acts like the board of the nonprofit. We set policy and guidance. We hire the executive director, in our case, the city manager, and we oversee the finances for the city. So we're, we're, so we're sort of operating at a, at a high level, setting direction, and then city staff go out and do those things. Um, you saw the eight departments in the city. I want to give you one good example of how uh, cities 
uh, county, state, federal, school districts work together. Uh, many of you know Meadowbrook Manor on Excelsior Boulevard. About a year and a half ago, there was a big change that went through uh, with new ownership. And we were hearing, I was hearing from residents about some of the challenges that they were having, and they were asking us for help. Well, we have some resources that we could bring to bear, but I was also, uh, because I had worked in the federal government before, I, I also knew that the feds had support. I picked up the phone and I called Congressman Ellison and I called all of these people who are sitting here with you, sitting here tonight, as well as the school district, brought in our police department, and I convened a meeting where I said, let's all get together and share the information that we've got about the resources we have to be able to help these folks. And so we, we, we couldn't help everybody, but we were able to help a lot of folks, and it's because every single one of these folks was either there in person or had their, their chief of staff there. So again, thank you all for supporting us. I think the, the uh, what I'll close with is is historically cities have been drink drive flush, right? Are the potholes filled? Is the water clean? That kind of stuff. That is shifting in a big way now. Um, as more and more things aren't getting done in different areas, communities are turning to cities and asking them to take those things on. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Uh, we we uh, have adopted a, a climate action plan for the city, um, and that is not something that cities were doing before, and actually, frankly, a lot of cities still not doing it. Um, but one of the areas, other areas that we were working very, very hard in that is a, an area that cities rarely do um, is we are about a year and a half into a race equity initiative. It is a citywide initiative to educate and train every single one of our city staff on equitable delivery of services. And now we're beginning the discussion about taking that, that conversation out to the community. I'm very, very appreciative that all of you are here. But if all of you look around the room, you will see the composition of this room is largely white. It is largely white middle class folks. I'm one of them. I don't feel guilty about being a white middle class person. I can't, white person, I can't change that. But what I can change is to make sure that our boards and commissions have better representation from, from all sorts of communities and that eventually our council has that and that our services are delivered equitably. And for those folks, which I don't get a lot of, but for those folks who sort of wonder, well, why would you do this? Aside from it being the right thing, all of our services will be better when we think through this lens. Our school district is way ahead of us on this. They've been doing it for a long, long time. We're trying to catch up. And with all of your help and support, I would appreciate that help and support. We're going we're gonna to be able to hopefully move the needle on that. But it will take everybody in this room to do that. So with that, my time is up. I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm going to turn the mic back over to the congressman Thanks and a lot. take it from here. Hey, uh, let's hear it for our uh, our mayor and our representatives, our commissioner. And uh, it is true that all of us work really well with uh, Senator Ron Latz, uh, who can't be here tonight, but he's here tonight. Uh, and also we work well with Amy and Al, our senators too. And, and I'll even tell you this, yesterday and today, me and Betty McCollum over there, all the way over there in St. Paul, you know, <laughs> figuring, out, figuring out how to work cooperatively and uh, you know, in uh, the in uh, Marion's colleagues uh, from the Ramsey and Hennepin, we're working it out. That we're telling that we'll support, you know, their East Metro stuff if they support our West Metro stuff. So we are really all in this thing together. Um, and so I just wanted to share that with you. Now it's your turn. Um, I would like to ask you because we got a full house, and this is a great thing. Give yourselves a hand for that. My goal is to make sure everybody who has something they want to share or a question can, can do that. If you see me uh, taking pictures or anything, I'm just trying to make sure more folks know about what we're doing and I'm taking notes on your questions. Matt is going to come to you uh, when you put your hand up and uh, you know, you can have, I'll propose a minute to say anything you want. You don't have to ask a question, you just say your opinion. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Clap your hands if you agree. <laughs> now, the minute you're gonna get a sign from Carl here, who's gonna show you the, sign, the stop sign when it's time. <laughs> and, but we also, uh, if somebody feels like they should go talk for uh, two minutes or three, we're gonna need somebody to enforce the one minute rule. Are you all right with me doing that? Yes. Put your hands together. 
that means that if somebody keeps going, you, you, you know, you're, you guys gonna back me up, right? Okay, so let's, let's talk. Uh, we, got, uh, we got about 40 minutes to have some quality conversation. Uh, let's keep, let, I mean, I'll recognize hands as I see them right here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to hold it to make Oh, good. Sure okay. Can you hear everyone? Okay. Um, Keith, first of all, I would like to, on behalf of senior citizens, talk about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, awesome. and HUD. New York Magazine has an article right now about HUD, and uh, Ben Carson didn't even want to be the HUD guy, and they had a meeting with him, and it, it said uh, to putting an end to state administrative organizations like HUD. And unfortunately, our... Um, uh, the superintendent couldn't be here tonight, but on, he called today on behalf of education. Uh, the person in charge of education never set foot in a public school. So that is a problem, and it is disconcerting. Where are we going to go on that? And Cheryl and Peggy, thank you always. Peggy, you, uh, you answered the phone in a supermarket the other night. So thank you very much about the oil pipeline. Thanks. And Marion, when I invite you to something, you come. And my goodness, Jake, yes, you're going to come and work with our seniors on Civics 101, and I appreciate that. And also the, uh, the work that you're doing. Where's the comprehensive plan at this point? Because that's due to the Met Council pretty soon. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. We're going to keep going, and then after about five or so, we'll, we'll get some responses. But thank you very much. Uh, Carl, I told him to sit in a prom stand in a prominent place so folks can see him. We actually have another state legislator who's joined us tonight. Uh, where, where is he? Stand up. My, so who, Steve Kaczynski was here. And uh, he's, uh, he's not in the 5th District, but he's welcome just as everybody else is. And, uh, you know, and I, I've told folks, hey, always come to our stuff if your congressperson's not doing it, because we want to make sure everybody's re represented. So let's keep going, Matt. All right. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Keith, I've been a part of your voting district uh, in the gerrymandered section of Edina for the past 18 years, and I just want to say thank you for doing something like this. I'm stationed abroad with the military, have been for eight years. Thank you. Let's hear it for it is, It's pretty awesome to come back home because a lot of the guys I'm stationed overseas with, they don't get this. And so it's pretty Shit. awesome to see. I'm curious, though, as a military member, um, we get our pay adjusted every year, and it changes by locality. So just like a federal employee, and Jake, you also working for the federal government understand that. And I was just curious, the living wage, we talk about it in terms of a number, but everything I've researched about it, uh, Wall Station abroad, Uncle Sam's nice enough to pay for some tuition over at Cambridge. Uh, I'm curious, what are our state representatives doing to test out new forms and systems of the living wage, just like Massachusetts, Utah, and Oregon did back in 1912 and 1913? Because instead of focusing on a number, they focus on some different types of equations. And I'm just curious what we're doing at the state level to try something new. Good question, good question. Let's take a few more. And uh, what, what branch of the service are you in? Uh, All right, thanks a lot. My son is in the Army. Uh, yep, so we're good about that. Yep. Hey. Hi, I have a question kind of on the tail of that. I noticed that um, housing costs in proportion to income <clears throat> are way out of whack. Yep. And like even here in the cities, like I make a decent income, but I can't afford the rents, especially in these all these luxury apartment buildings that are going up. And I'm like, who, who is living there? Who can afford that? And what can be done to close that gap so that it's not so out of whack? And I know that's an issue all over the country, not just here. You're right. Thank you for asking those questions. Those are all good ones. Uh, and uh, you, we'll just take one more for this young lady and then we'll have our panel respond. This question is for Mayor Spano. Who do I contact if to talk about new playground equipment in my neighborhood? Good question. My phone number's on that sheet of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Call Jake. All right. Actually, actually use the email. All right. All right. I accidentally cut the phone line in my house doing a home improvement project, so I had to change the number. So uh, let's respond. Um, and, if, and if we've asked folks to uh, ask their question within a minute, and many of them are lower than a minute, 
let, let's try to respond in a minute. Um, uh, does anybody want to uh, respond first? Go for it. I'll speak to the affordable housing piece. So just, uh, this is a, uh, I think we're just, oh, I've, I've never needed a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> just ask my kids. Um, so there are a lot of programs that the, the federal government uh, funds and we receive some money through community development block grants which we use to support housing, affordable housing and, and home re repair. Um, however, we are one of the first, I believe we're the first city in the state to adopt an affordable, uh, an inclusionary affordable housing policy, which means that if you're a developer and you come to us and you say, hey, I want to build one of these nice luxury uh, market rate apartment buildings, and uh, there are some needs on the, on the property, and I need some TIF money, tax increment financing from the city, we're like, okay, that's great. But that means that 20% of the units in your building need to be affordable at either, we've, and we've got a couple of different formulas um, that we use, but at like 50 or 60% of area median income, all right? So we're starting to write these things into our housing policies saying, if you want our help, if you want us to play, you're going to have to play as well. And to be quite honest with you, at first we were told developers will hate this and they will run away, well, that's not happened. And in fact, we have one developer, at least one developer we know of, who when we had that requirement, he realized that if he just put in like another eight units, it would actually unlock another group of federal monies that he could access. So he actually put more units in than we required. Um, and so those are some of the things that the communities are doing and we're also going to be uh, very shortly taking up some renter and homeowner or some renter protections um, in probably the next couple, three or four weeks. So that's one thing at least that some cities are doing and I would, the affordable housing is a huge problem especially for seniors um, and what we really need is a region wide strategy on this. Cities can't be doing this sort of onesie twosie. It's got to be all of us together. I thought I'd just quick add with the state level, we, have, we had some bonding money in the last bonding bill, actually two bonding bills ago to really help with affordable housing. We also look at policies to try to incentivize developers and, and different things. Um, one of the big things too has been talked about with keeping kids in place for education to help with the achievement gap is incentivizing with money for folks to be able to find that affordable housing so they can keep a student in a school district for at least three years to get that grounding in their education. So there is some money at the state level, but I know the feds and the county really take the brunt of this. Thank you. Um, huge issue and, and an issue, of course, being faced in metropolitan areas across the U.S. Something that Hennepin County is doing that's uh, very new and different is we've put in seed money. Um, so we put in $3 million and uh, foundations and other partners have matched that money. So now that money is $25 million. And that money is going to be used to help people compete on the market, open market, for naturally occurring affordable housing. So for example, I think there's been a couple mentions of Meadowbrook uh, here in St. Louis Park. Now there's a fund that uh, a buyer could help access to help them buy a place like Meadowbrook and then keep it affordable, as opposed to coming in, you know, putting marble countertops in and then jacking up the rents and moving everybody out. We've, we have some money in this pot. It's being managed by a nonprofit that'll um, be available at lower interest rates, uh, kind of advantageously, help them have the deeper pockets that they might need so they don't need to come in and redevelop and kind of superficially glamorize and then jack up rents. Um, and I just want to lift up one organization that recently had a forum here on affordable housing is Jewish Community Action. Um, it's pretty powerful. They're doing good organizing work around this. So just connect with them. Um, so I just want to answer your question. First of all, thank you for your service. Uh, my brother is a retired Marine. Um, so thanks. Uh, my, um, I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> Um, about a living wage. And I will tell you, when we worked to increase the minimum wage of Minnesota to 950, that was a battle. And it was even a battle within, when, I'll just say it, we had a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate and in the governor's office. It was even a battle. And so 
I just want to name that they're sort of like not good guys or bad guys as part of this fight, but that we absolutely have to make sure that we're sort of talking to everybody about what is realistic. So we've been having the conversation about $15, um, but I think that there's also a conversation that you're bringing up, which is about what is a true living wage? Um, there's folks like the Jobs Now Coalition that's looking into this, but until we have more, I'm going to be, I'm going to keep this nonpartisan if I can. Until we have more people who share our values of making sure, right, that if you work 40 hours a week, you don't have to live in poverty, we're going to, yeah. We're not going to necessarily be where we need to be on this particular issue. But there's folks who are doing the research, right? We're starting to have these conversations. But right now, um, it is it is a non-starter. But I will say that we've seen, right, in the, the index to inflation, the minimum wage will go to 965 um, starting January 1st. But you know and I know that that's not enough. So we have more work to do. I appreciate your question. And let's work on it. So um, I believe in a philosophy known as housing first. Housing first is the basic idea that unless you stabilize housing and make it affordable, everything else in a person's life is going to be very, very hard to achieve. Rent eats first. And if it doesn't, you're going to be looking at eviction. So why have the houses gone, house, housing prices gone up so fast and what can we do about it? The simple answer is, since 2008, uh, literally about four plus million houses went out on the market. They were bought up by hedge funds like Blackstone. You ever heard of this? And Blackstone then uh, basically uh, what you would call securitized them into a security that you could buy this and then started increasing rents, did some repairs and started increasing rents. At the same time, we're losing affordable housing why are we losing it? Well, a lot of reasons. We haven't put any money in um, public housing in years. In fact, we let it deteriorate. We're losing public housing units across the country. And uh, I mean, for example, just, just out of ill repair. We're losing affordable housing uh, uh, units when it comes to, uh, say, manufactured housing. In fact, in St. Anthony, uh, we just lost Lowry Grove. The residents there were trying to buy the land <coughs> From the owner, he said no and put them all out. And he's going to you know, probably build some high-priced housing there. So there's a, these trends are happening. Bottom line is uh, we're seeing the, you know, people needing housing at a time when we're losing it. And we're seeing certain groups be able to buy up huge chunks of housing, which gives them market position which allows them to charge exorbitant rent. All while this is happening, the federal government's commitment to affordable housing has, has trailed off. And quite frankly, it's, it's been since Reagan. And we've done a little bit better during uh, Clinton and Obama, quite frankly, but we have not altered the basic trend. So for example, um, if you look at a program called the Mortgage Interest Deduction, um, I, 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 I take the mortgage interest deduction. So I'm not saying it's a bad program. I am saying that it costs about $85 billion a year that is written, is people don't have to pay. I have a bill that says, what if we capped it at $500,000? What if we limited it to one house? What if we made it a credit so everybody could take advantage of it, not just people who itemize? And what if we took the extra money, because there'd be extra money, and put it into affordable housing? And did things like low-income housing tax credit, uh, did things like um, you know, uh, Section 8, did things, actually made it easier for people to, to we build more affordable housing. What would happen then is that, is that you know, the developer that now says, look, why not buy bigger and bigger and bigger because you got more house so you can have a bigger deduction, then you'd start seeing the housing sizes go down. And you'd start, and, and, and let me tell you, realtors shouldn't be against this because I'm talking about keeping the money in housing. But it's the difference between buy, building a McMansion and building a lot of workforce housing. Very small, more than 95% of all Americans have a mortgage smaller than $500,000. 
And yet we see ourselves in the middle of this crisis. Um, I think that uh, that's, that's one proposal. Somebody told me a few years ago when I introduced this, I said, if you introduce that, that it's the third rail of politics, you will not be reelected. Maybe I shouldn't be telling you all about it. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I believe that, we, that people will be better off if, there's, if they can afford their housing. We don't want people to pay more than about 30% of their income in their housing. It's typical for people to be paying up to half. And every time you do that, you know, uh, that's school supplies that don't get bought. You know, that's food that doesn't get bought, that's utilities that don't get paid, doctor bills. It's, it's, it's not a good way to run a society. And let me just tell you, you know, this economy that we live in did pretty well during the 50s and even the 60s, and we put money into this kind of stuff. This idea that if you cut taxes for the very wealthy and big companies and they're going to put it back into uh, jobs, it's... I'm waiting for the person to prove to me that that works. <laughs> what we do know, according to economists, um, that we have, we're at the highest income inequality since Great Depression. And it is creating instability, political instability, and it has created a very low demand economy and slow growth. You want to get some growth, you got to put money back in people's pockets. One of the ways to do that is lower their housing costs. This is not going to hurt middle class people. And it's not going to, and, and, and actually, it's going to actually help rich, rich people. But let me just tell you this. If you're the kind of person who could afford a $500,000 mortgage, God bless you. I don't think that if you're buying a million-dollar home, that the thing's going to make you not buy it is the, is, the, is, the, is the mortgage interest. Mark Zuckerberg, he's going to get the house. He's going to get, I want that one. Oh, that one. He will knock down a house to make sure his view's better. So my point is, Let's just have a more equitable um, you know, distribution to make sure that everybody can, can live. So what, what, are, what are some other things that, that, that we might do? I think it's, it's critically important for us to get a handle on these evictions. You know, we have 3,000 evictions in the city of Minneapolis. Once you get an unlawful detainer on your record, it gets real tough to get into another unit. You can get one. But it probably will be uh, not n lower, lower quality and more expensive. And so there's a great book called Evicted. Anybody heard of it? A guy named Matthew Desmond wrote it. I, he's going to be here on October 21st speaking. I really hope you guys can come and check it out. We could talk more about affordable housing. It's one of the most important things that I work on. I believe in it very firmly. It's key. Also, when it comes to f more manufactured housing, let me tell you, Usually when you say somebody lives in a trailer park, you're thinking that's not a good place to live. This is not true. Uh, it all has to do with the upkeep. There's a place called Park Plaza in the district, on the northeast part of the district. These people used to have, they own the trailer, but they don't own the land that they live on. They actually bought the land that they live on from the owner. They went from one sewer to about six. All the drainage problems got eliminated. They put curb cuts, curb um, bumps so that you can't just zoom through there anymore. They put more lighting up there. They repave the, 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 and I'm telling you, all of them say, hey, we love it here. And it's an affordable option. I got a bill that says, look, if you want to sell the land that these folks live on, you can, it's your land. But you can get a tax credit if you sell it to the residents. So that's another bill we just dropped in. If you got ideas on housing, I want to hear about them. I think this is critical. Now, on the issue of livable wage, um, absolutely, you know, I think, you know, they're passing increases in minimum wages all over the country, even in conservative Republican states, Arkansas, Alaska, all this. I believe that we, Martin said, we, we used to have, this is what we really need. We, they, we talk about minimum wage. My opinion, we should be talking about maximum wage, too. So if you are a CEO, Look, if you're a CEO and you want to get a lot of money, get a lot of money. No problem. But if you're a publicly traded company, your pay ought to be some kind of function of what the average worker gets so that everybody can benefit. I mean, think about these companies where the CEO gets $20 million a year and the average worker's getting not seven twenty-five. That doesn't make any sense. There used to be a time when business owners feel like, look, man, these are my people. They made me rich. I'm going to look out for them, too. I'm not going to take some big, huge salary and let them live in poverty. 
But nowadays, you know, in this quarterly driven profit maximization culture that we live in, you know, you see a guy who uh, basically, in my opinion, misleads Wells Fargo, walks away with $173 million golden parachute, and the average line worker is making 12 bucks. This is, the, this is how we've gotten out of whack. We've got to do a lot of things on corporate governance. We've got to do, and we've got to make sure that the average pay, we've we got to return to the day when the, the CEO makes no more than about 40 times more than the average worker. Now we're up to 300, 250. It's ridiculous. Let's talk to some more folks. Yep. Uh, Matt, we've got plenty. There's a gentleman right here, Matt, right up front. Yeah, I've got a simple question for Congressman Ellison, and that is, before the year 2020, how do we get rid of the president? Okay, let's uh, take a few more, and then we'll get right to it. I got, I got some answers for you. Let's take a few. Uh, thanks to all of you up there for all the great work you do, but this is another question for <laughs> Representative Allison, yep. which is when you get back in the month of September now, there's going to be a battle, a battle royale about the debt ceiling. Debt ceiling. And uh, the national debt has to be paid uh, off by tax revenue. I mean, yep. that's how the government pays its bills. So how can Trump be produced, President Trump be coming up now with this huge tax cut for individuals and corporations because we, you know, I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense that we're going to try to, you know, complain about the national debt, but then we're going to cut taxes. It's just ridiculous. So I hope you fight that. You can bet on it. <laughs> Let's get one more, then we'll uh, get around. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, giving us the opportunity to come here tonight and listen and speak to you. Um, non-issue related question I my wife and I live here in St. Louis Park we have two young kids we both work full-time jobs you know beyond reading what's in the papers beyond checking Facebook or sending emails what can someone like me who works over 40 hours a week and have young children and a family do to be more involved you know reasonably like beyond canvassing every two years on an election or, or something like that, whether it's you know some very simple or involved, just something more that we can do and help, hopefully, hopefully, excuse me, include our kids so that they can learn what they need to do, you know, as thriving citizens of a community. Thank you. Great. So I'll, I'll go. I'll be quick. A lot of it turns on what your passions are, but let me tell you, man, if you just coach T-ball, that's super important in this community. I swear, you might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. No, it is a huge deal. And those kids you te coach T-ball in, you, they're going to see you around in 10 and 20 years. They're going to remember you. They'll never forget you. I used to coach track and field. I'm into track and field, and I know something about it. I coach kids. I see these grown kids all the time with their kids on the hip. When I met them, they were in their teens and younger. So that is important. Coach a, a Cub Scout troop, very important. Boy Scout troop. I mean, these kind of things, they may not go to the global issues of president and all that stuff, but they make an awesome difference in neighborhood. I think some of my friends will have some other ideas. Um, you know, first of all, I, I have to tell you, I think impeachment is a very big deal. Um, I, uh, I, I think that uh, it's nothing that should be done lightly. Uh, it, is, it is incredibly huge, and we throw this idea around a lot. Um, I'm not introducing any articles of impeachment, but if they came up, um, let me tell you, I would take them very seriously, and I want to hear all the evidence, but I'm inclined to believe there is a substantial case to be made. Why? Why? No, 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 no. Why? Because if the president and his top people sat in a room where a representative of a foreign government was saying, I'm going to help you win an election against your opponent, and I'm representing Russia, and that actually is proven, I don't think I have any other choice than to say, that's a high crime misdemeanor, and you have to go. Now, I'm willing to wait until to see what Mueller comes up with. But you fire the guy who's the head of the FBI who's investigating you, that, that's suspicious. 
um, to, to say the least. I mean, really, firing Comey is, look, he could have fired Comey and said, I'm not firing him for any reason other than I want a new guy. That's not what he said. He went to the Russians and said, I, we got rid of that nut job, was I think the word he used, to the Russian ambassador. How do you explain that away? I have no idea. And, and, and so there are substantial reasons, and I could go on and on and on. Uh, and I'm deeply disturbed by the fact he never turned over his taxes. He never set up a blind trust. He's still getting money from his, uh, um, his businesses. And, I mean, and when somebody buys a $200,000 membership to Mar-a-Lago, that money goes right to him. When people go stay, at, I mean, you know, the emoluments clause issue is still being adjudicated. I think there's real problems here. You know what? The one thing, one thing I won't allow. No, let me tell you this. One thing I'm not going to allow. Nope, nope, I am not. Sir, sir, I'm sorry. Sir, I'm sorry. Sir, it's not fair. Let me tell you, you are more than, you are more than welcome to wait your turn. Nope, I'm sorry, sir. I'm simply not going to let... You know, sir, I'm sorry, but you are out of line. You are out of line. You're out of line, sir. You have to wait your turn. You can't disrespect people like that. Sir, 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 you, you think that what you're doing is noble, but it's just rude. It's just rude. It's simply rude. You know, sir... No Sir, money. you could have. Even brought it up. All you care about is yourself. So, it's yourself. <clears throat> sit down. Shut up. You'll have your turn. He's talking. You can have you your have turn. You the microphone, and then it'll be your turn. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. Thank you. Sit down, and don't be rude. All you care about is yourself. So anyway, debt ceiling. On the debt ceiling. So... You know what, sir? I'm sorry, but you are going this, you're going about what you're trying to do all wrong. Hey, if you want to, if you want to talk about this, all of us are more than happy to talk to you about it later. But all of these, all of these folks are waiting. Sir, 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 you know what, at, at this point, sir, you just need to respect everybody else. You know, I have to conclude that you're deliberately trying to destroy this meeting. Well then sit down, sir. Well then, sir. I have to conclude you're deliberately trying to destroy the meeting. Why would you do that? Well then have a seat and, and, and we'll be happy to recognize you in due order. You know what, sir? You can ask any question you want, and we will respond to it, but you don't get to do what you're doing. You are out of line. You are absolutely wrong. You know what? All right. So debt ceiling. Debt ceiling. The debt ceiling, here's the thing. When we appropriate money, including for disaster relief, we are committing the budget of the United States. The fact that we have... A, have to pass a debt ceiling, most countries just automatically say if you've appropriated the money, you have raised the debt ceiling. Now, if we don't pay the debt, raise the debt ceiling, we will have broken our promise to every bondholder that purchased a bond on the expectation that the United States would repay. We cannot break the debt ceiling. Interest rates will explode all over the world. So are we going to pass a debt ceiling? My answer is yes. Uh, we know that Mnuchin, we know that, uh, and all these guys are saying, and, and even, even uh, Paul Ryan says, we're going to raise the debt ceiling. But uh, there's about 50 people in the Freedom Caucus who say they're not. So at this point, without Democrat votes, Democratic votes, they're not going to be able to pass it. So we're saying, if you load it up with a bunch of stuff, like that $1.6 billion wall, you're putting yourself in a real bad situation because we cannot vote for that, 
right? So we're saying clean debt ceiling, we'll be happy to supply the votes to pass it. You guys want to say anything about this, though? I was just going to add, I really appreciate the question in the back about how do you get involved when you're really busy with kids and, and working. I was at the same point as you are 14 some, 15 some years ago. My kids are 22, 20, and 17 now, and they're pretty self-sufficient, so I'm lucky. But just find ways that you're passionate about to get involved. I got involved in our, our Hopkins Legislative Action Coalition to start advocating, and I started out just doing the phone calls at night or emailing here. The best way you can be involved, too, is to become an informed voter, become an informed citizen on what's going on at the local level, state level. You get bombarded every day at what's happening at the federal level. No offense, Keith. <laughs> but there, a lot of people don't, aren't tuned in at the local level, and having served on a city government for nine years, I can tell you, that's the one bastion of sanity that still sometimes functions at a nonpartisan way that you can have the most effect at you can have the quickest reaction to. So find something that you really care about and find a way that you can plug in there. Be informed, signing up for stuff like weekly reports, stuff from Congress, stuff from your school district. Just be informed. Um, and then I was going to say, um, I'm getting rid of the president before 2020. We have to work really hard in 2018 so he, we can mitigate the damage he's doing by giving him a better Congress and Senate. <laughs> so think about that. And then um, uh, Representative Flanagan kind of leaned over to me when we talked about the debt ceiling and reminded me that this is happening at the state level too. Um, we passed, neither of us voted for it, but we passed a tax bill that looked small for the first biennium, but in the out years, it does a devastating thing to our state budget. It has a lot of stuff that just escalates and gives away money that is going to really hurt us in the long run. So, yeah, we'll have deficits within two years. Even like the Met Council budget that runs all our transit, they're going to fall off a cliff in two years and have over $100,000 in debt. They won't be able to run the, train, the, the buses or the trains. So we're having that issue at the state level, too, where, you know, at the state level, you might not know, every two years we have to balance our budget. So we can only pass a balanced budget. But we have out years, two more years after that, two more years of that, that we look at and go, ooh, if we pass this, that's not going to look very good on. But some folks can say, hey, but we did our job. We passed a balanced budget. Who cares what it looks like in four years? But we do have to care what it looks like in four years. And that's the struggle we're going to have now because of the tax bill that passed. And we can talk about that afterwards if anybody wants to. I really appreciated your question as a fellow parent who's trying to figure this out. I was like, I'm going to run for office, so you should do that. Um, but <laughs> I think part of it in this, in this moment, um, sometimes I have to turn off social media for a minute because it gets to be a little too much. Um, but I'll say this. I agree with Congressman Ellison, Congressman, not Keith, Congressman Ellison, um, that, uh, that it's really important um, to get engaged and involved in the community. So if that's at your kid's school, if it's also working on a campaign for someone you care about, I think like that's an opportunity to get your ideas and the things you care about directly connected right to the campaign. But I'm also going to say this. Being a parent right now, whew. As a, as a mom of a little brown girl, right, of a little native girl, who asks questions about what is happening on TV, and who asks questions about why people are mad at other people for how they look, that to me feels like one of the most powerful ways that you can be engaged and involved right now, is having really tough, candid, important conversations with your kids, especially, as Jake was talking about, as a white ally in this community. We are really fortunate to live in St. Louis Park. I am thrilled that Siobhan will go to Peter Hobart while she will have 47 other Native kids and a Native teacher, right? And there's only so much that I can do at home. So I just want to lift that up as one of the most important pieces as we're looking at what's happening every day right now, um, that being a parent and having those tough conversations about your kid, with your kids about identity um, and caring for other folks is more important now than ever before.
Um, maybe I'll just add a little bit of humor, but I had to just like crack up and send you a hug across the room when you were describing how busy you were and you know all these things distracting you. But you're like, but I've, I'm already going canvassing and I'm already you know door knocking every two years. I'm like, oh God, love him. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Don't change a thing. <laughs> so thank you for that. And also, by the way, hook 'em horns. <laughs> Really quick, um, we've heard a number of these uh, items serving on parent-teacher boards. I did that. Um, in St. Louis Park, we have a really, really involved and developed neighborhood association system. At almost every single one of our neighborhoods has an organized group that helps to engage the neighborhood. It's really helpful for us, you know, for example, not just on you know, some neighborhoods they like to do bake sales and plant swaps, and that's awesome. And some neighborhoods are just like super involved in like construction and traffic, and, and that's awesome too. We need that feedback. I, I, I'm just going to give a pitch because I know that Karen Waters, one of our school board members, is here, um, and my wife is a teacher, and she will smack me in the face if, I, if she finds out I didn't say something. I would say the number one thing that you can do that I, that I think is important is go read to kids in school. Right? Talk to your kid's teacher and say, what are the days that I could come in, right? Take half a day from work. And I, tell, and I will tell you, in, in my experience doing that, um, it, is, it is amazing. It feels, so, it feels so incredibly good to be able to do that. And for kids to see a par an adult who is not their parent or their teacher invest time in them is a very important asset towards their long-term growth. So that would be one thing. So let me tell everybody, we told you uh, that we would ask you to be here from 6 to 7.30. It's just about that time. Uh, we, we, yeah, we, we'll, we, could, we probably got time for one or two questions, but then, we, then I'm going to dismiss. I can try to stay after a little bit, but I'll tell you, my staff's saying, you got a 7.30 and you got to go. But I'll, I'll be late for my next thing if folks want to tell me something important. And maybe others can, too, as well, of course. We all get booked up till 9 o'clock most nights. But I think we can only do about one or two, maybe one or two more. So, uh, uh, I, well, why don't you come on up? Come on up here. Come on right on up here. How upset I was about what just happened. Uh, I can't stand good because I have. Uh, I'm just going to say something about how upsetting it was what just happened. He said we're all selfish people. We were talking about the homeless, and we all probably have homes. We're talking about people that need help. I don't really understand what he's talking about. Apparently, he can't hear so good. Well, uh, anybody else? Um, uh, well, yeah, right over there. So along, like, specifically for St. Louis Park, um, you look out the window here, and you see new development that a majority of us would not be able to pay the rent on those $2,300 apartments at Excelsior and Grand. Beautiful, great for the neighborhood. Again, down on France, and you can cut through any part of St. Louis Park that's a wonderful community. And with the massive amount of development, and then inquiring on like the affordability, all of these $2,000 a month one bedroom apartments at what point is St. Louis Park going to say this is too much? This is not this is not good for our community that's here. It's bringing in tax dollars. It's developing, um, you know, maybe properties that need developing. But there's got to be something that this is impacting the community worse than traffic, worse than these, like I said, unaffordable homes. Even if there's 20% that are going to be $1,200 for a studio or something. It's really something that I think in a few years, people are going to say, what happened to St. Louis Park community? And what are your thoughts on that going forward? Because right now, the economy and building, everything's, everything's great. But how does that impact St. Louis Park going forward? Development. It's, a, it's always a big development and sidewalks seem to be two of the, the hottest issues in our community. So number one thing that I, and, and, uh, that I will say is, for example, um, the council has not been monolithic in its support of development, right? We had the Bridgewater property. There was a development there that moved very far along in the process, but we said no. 
Um, not sure what's going to come back in that spot, um, but something will will happen there. Um, the and this, it's actually sort of a perfect, because you, Judy asked a first question about the comp plan, and you're sort of asking a question about development, and I wanted to hit uh, Judy's comment, and this ties it together nicely, is we are just in the sort of end phase of our, what we call vision, our vision process. It's something we do about every 10, 11 years. We sort of go out to the community and survey the community on what do you like, what don't you like, what are your aspirations. We heard some talk about pumping the brakes on development. And so I would imagine that that'll get reflected in that vision document in, in one way or another. I think St. Louis Park will continue to grow. Um, I think the areas that it continues to grow in may, may change. Um, and I think the challenge for us is as more people, as we are adding people, we're almost 50,000 people now, and we weren't at that level and, uh, since back in the 60s, um, but as we continue to grow, we're landlocked, so we, we can't go out, um, and I don't think that girl uh, that was in the back of the room wants us to take out her, her park, um, so short of those sorts of things, we have to kind of go up, right? So we are trying, we are going to be looking at that, and I would imagine that there'll be a, a lot of robust discussion when we get into the fall, when we're talking about the vision you results. Met met, yeah, well, yes, Met Council certainly has, met, yes, Met Council certainly has a say in that as well, so. Yeah. So it's time to wrap up, uh, but let me assure, let me just say this to you, just so you know. Democracy's messy, and it has an element of chaos, and it's okay. I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I've been working on uh, Harvey all day. I really have. My staff can tell you that. I've been working on Hurricane Harvey all day long, and uh, Minnesotans, including some in this room when I walked in here, were asking me about it. You cannot credit everyone who says something with knowing everything. Some people offer their opinions. They may not be fact-based. They may be fact-based. Don't let that disturb you. So this is an incredibly compassionate community. People are fighting for justice for all, even if they're doing really well, all the time. And I want you to know that about yourselves, because it's true. And so what I want to do is ask you to give it up for our awesome sec uh, representatives. I want you to know that this is not the beginning nor the end of this conversation. It will continue and go on. Reach out to us, talk to us, call on us. We're here for you. Thank you much, and have a nice night.